By extremely popular request, in this video I'm starting a series talking about the UK legislation for firearms. So if this interests you, make sure you hit that subscribe button straight away. In this video I'm kicking off by talking about imitation firearms and realistic imitation firearms, sometimes referred to as replicas. These are collectively and commonly, although not exclusively, referred to as airsoft weaponry and BB guns. And if you are interested in airsoft and combat training in general, then I've got a special bonus for you in this video, because I'm going to offer you the opportunity to do a full weekend of training with me and with one of my colleagues, an SBS Elite Forces veteran, for the full weekend on airsoft, tactical training both as an individual, as teams, close protection training, including the close quarters combat and behavioral training. More about that a little bit later, but if you're eager, there's a link in the description below to sign up to the mailing list for more information as and when it comes out. So as you can imagine, the UK legislation for firearms is fairly broad and it's fairly robust. And in the last 20 years or so, it's undergone some fairly major and dramatic changes, all of which I will discuss in this video and subsequent videos. The main and overarching piece of legislation I'm sure you're familiar with is the Firearms Act of 1968, which not only regulates traditional firearms, for which it provides that you must have a relative certificate, uh, but it also governs the airsoft weaponry under Section 57A. More about that in a moment. Another piece of legislation that's important is the Violent Crime Reduction Act of 2006, which until some amendments were made, was all but going to ban airsoft weaponry in their entirety, until there was a few narrow exceptions that come into play, again more about those in a moment. Those were brought in by the regulations that came in after this Violent Crime Reduction Act by way of the Realistic Imitation Firearms Regulations of 2007. Finally, we have the Policing and Crime Act, which updated the definitions of a lethal barreled weapon and established these clear distinction between airsoft guns and firearms and ultimately amended the Firearms Act with Section 57A. Now before we go absolutely any further, it goes without saying that brandishing any kind of weapon, even if it's just a toy, with the purposes of causing someone else fear, alarm, distress, threat and all the rest of it, is going to be a criminal offence. So you must never do that with any kind of item, regardless of whether it's a toy, an imitation weapon, a realistic imitation firearm, or, of course, a real firearm. Starting at the very basic, Section 1 of the Firearms Act of 1968 provides that it is an offence for any person to have in his possession or to purchase or to acquire a firearm to which this section relates without holding a firearm certificate in force at that time, or otherwise as has been authorised by such a certificate. But now coming to what people refer to as airsoft weaponry, there is a distinction between an imitation firearm and a realistic imitation firearm, sometimes referred to as a replica imitation firearm, although the legislation uses realistic for purposes that I'll come back to in a moment. There are some distinct differences between the two, and these are within the regulations themselves. The broad distinction, quite obviously, being that a realistic imitation firearm is virtually indistinguishable from a real firearm, although it isn't. And it is a bit of a myth that they can be amended or adapted to fire actual projectiles, as opposed to the little plastic bullets, which again I'll come back to in a moment. The most commonly used distinction between the two is a two-tone colour on the imitation firearms, as against the realistic imitation firearms. They are bright colours which generally regard the item to be unrealistic as a firearm. For this we can jump straight into the Realistic Firearms Regulations of 2007. Regulation 7 provides these colours, and it provides that the colours specified are bright red, bright orange, bright yellow, bright green, bright pink, bright purple, and bright blue. The regulation provides that for the purposes of this section, a colour that is to be regarded as unrealistic for a firearm only if it is a colour specified from that list, or in the alternative that the imitation firearm is transparent. In addition to the colour distinguishing an imitation versus a realistic imitation, as provided by Section 38 of the Violent Crime Reduction Act of 2006, which provides for the meaning of a realistic imitation firearm, other matters that are taken into account include differences in size and the shape, 
and of course the principal colour. But it's important to note, as per subsection 2, that an imitation firearm is not to be regarded as distinguishable from a real firearm for any practical purposes if it is only distinguished by an expert, close examination, or as a result of attempting to load or fire it. In other words, if it can only be distinguished from a real firearm by an expert, close examination, or by trying to fire the thing or load the thing, then it is not going to be regarded as distinguishable from a real firearm, and thus the more stringent rules will apply. So now talking about those rules and which are the stricter rules and why, and how it is that these airsoft skirmishes, as they are referred to, fit within the legislation. Well, the Violent Crime Reduction Act provides that it is illegal to sell an imitation firearm to anyone under the age of 18. Now, having talked about the broad distinction between an imitation firearm and a realistic imitation firearm, here's the main difference between the restrictions. Speaking first of all about the imitation firearm, which, remember, will need to be distinguishable, as I've already discussed, Section 24A of the Firearms Act 1968 provides that it's an offence for anyone under the age of 18 to purchase an imitation firearm and for anyone to sell an imitation firearm to anyone under the age of 18. There is a defence available for anyone that's charged with such an offence of selling an imitation firearm to someone under 18 if they can show that they have a reasonable ground for believing that the purchaser was 18 or over. There are also, of course, other offences concerning having in your possession an item that is capable of being used to convert an imitation firearm and other such things, but I'm not going into those quite in this video. Moving now to realistic imitation firearms. Those are those that don't have the bright colours and are otherwise indistinguishable. Section 36 of the Violent Crime Reduction Act 2006 made it a very broad offence for any person to manufacture, sell, import or cause a realistic imitation firearm to be brought into Great Britain. This act also made it an offence to modify an imitation firearm so that it becomes a realistic imitation firearm. One obvious example would be spray painting something that used to be blue to be black and therefore rendering it indistinguishable. Section 38 sub 1 of the act defines a realistic imitation firearm which is as follows. First of all, that it has the appearance that it's so realistic to make it indistinguishable for all practical purposes from a real firearm and that it's neither a deactivated firearm nor is it an antique. So how then with this very broad restriction is it at all possible for these airsoft skirmishes to take place with realistic imitation firearms? Well it's section 37 of the act that provides for very specific defences. First of all if the realistic imitation firearm is made available for one or more of the following purposes. First of all that it might be for a museum or a gallery. Secondly, it's for the purposes of theatrical performances and rehearsals of such performances. Thirdly, in the production of films, meaning within the Act of the Copyright Designs and Patent Act of 1988. Fourthly, the production of television programmes. Fifthly, the organisation and holding of historical reenactments organised and held by persons specified or described for the purposes by this section by regulations made by the Secretary of State below. I'll come back to those in a moment. And finally, for the purposes of functions that a person has in their capacity as a person in the service of His Majesty. So now we get to what really makes these airsoft skirmishes possible. As I mentioned before, the Realistic Imitation Firearms Regulations of 2007, which was a statutory instrument passed, which provided two further defences under Section 36 of the Violent Crime Reduction Act 2006. First of all, it is a defence for making realistic imitation firearms available for what is referred to as permitted activities. This is defined as the acting out of military or law enforcement scenarios for the purposes of recreation. As I said, bonus coming at the end of the video, so make sure you keep watching. And of course, this was primarily intended to cover those who are participating in airsoft skirmishing. Because essentially, the act in and of itself 
would have provided this fairly blanket ban on anyone owning, using these realistic imitation firearms. But of course, a great many people wanted a provision in law that would allow them to continue this activity under very specific circumstances. Therefore, and as a result, it is a requirement under these regulations that third-party liability insurance is held in connection with the activities. And then of course, tagged onto all of that is a second defense for the display of realistic imitation firearms at a permitted event which is defined as a commercial event at which firearms or realistic imitation firearms or both are offered for sale or they are displayed. Now turning to those regulations itself, the specific defense for airsoft skirmishing that I'm referring to is under regulations 3, 4 and 5. Regulation 3 provides that it's a defense in proceedings for an offense under section 36 of the act to show that the conduct was for the purpose only of making the imitation firearm in question available for one or more of the purposes as under section 2. Those purposes are the organization and holding of permitted activities for which public liability insurance is held in relation to liabilities to third parties arising from or in connection with the organization and holding of those activities. And secondly, for the purposes of display at that permitted event. And for the interpretation of what permitted activities are, that is in regulation 2, which provides that the meaning of a permitted activity is the acting out of military or law enforcement scenarios for the purposes of recreation. And just for completeness and to round off the discussion, it's section 57A of the Firearms Act 1968 that provides the exception for airsoft guns themselves. An airsoft gun not being regarded as a firearm for the purposes of the act and is defined to be a barreled weapon of any description which is designed to discharge only a small plastic missile, whether or not it is capable of discharging any other kind of missile, and is not capable of discharging a missile of any kind with kinetic energy at the muzzle of the weapon that exceeds the permitted level. The permitted kinetic energy level, as in subsection 4, in the case of a weapon capable of discharging two or more missiles successively without repeated pressure on the trigger is 1.3 joules and otherwise in other cases is two and a half joules. And as for the small plastic missiles themselves, they are made wholly or partly from plastics, spherical and do not exceed eight millimeters in diameter. So now that you've had a broad overview of firearms legislation, if you are interested in airsoft, either as an individual or as a team, and you would like to attend a full weekend or part thereof of training with an elite forces veteran, both on tactical training, drills, close protection training, close combat and behavioral training, then sign up at the link on the screen and in the description below, and I will come back to you with dates, prices, timing, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. But to give you an idea of what you're in for, take a look at this. Paul Arm Academy is the first and only time civilians can get a taste of military style training. You're gonna be pushed to your limit. All of our instructors are military or police or martial artists that have taught the military. You'll learn to spot danger, how to recognize body language, micro expressions of people how the military and special forces conduct close quarter combat operations as well as the police. Tactics on rapid entry. And then we'll pressure test you, we'll put you with a partner, we'll give you someone to protect and we'll attack them using all the previous skills but now you're responsible for someone. Close protection, behavioural detection. So if you have to use the skills, you can justify them. The physical threats if someone attacks you, how to avoid them, evade it, disarm it if necessary, if you need to pin them, control them. Then we put you under pressure that you've never been under before. You've got to learn that manoeuvres, that tactics, that body language, that communication. And then we'll do all of the same again, but we'll introduce some weapons. We'll have people attack you from different directions, which is real life. People don't get attacked from the front. Learn the weapons that the SF use. Learn the tools the SF use. If you can do that and you pass the course, you then can educate 
all the people either in your company or in your dojo. This is suitable for military, police, close protection officers, martial artists and anyone that wants to further their career along this type of work.